There was once a boy named Milo who didn't know what to do with himself, not just sometimes, but always. When he was in school, he longed to be out, and when he was out, he longed to be in. On the way, he thought about coming home, and coming home, he thought about going. Wherever he was, he wished he was somewhere else, and when he got there, he wondered why he'd bothered. Two to three generations of readers, fans, who will come up and say, this is, this book changed my life. Naughty and I were the... Uh, I did the meals, I never found out what you did. One of us was Harpo and the other was Groucho, and we <laughs> never figured that out either. I, I would walk into the room and my father would say, aha, I see you're coming early since lately. You used to be behind before, but now you're first at last. And I would stand there absolutely befuddled. I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> well, I've been drawing all my life. I mean, since the time I was a little boy. How long since I learned how to draw? Maybe a week ago. <laughs> if you're lucky. It's just that it's about so many things on so many levels, it's hard to think of how to, how to really summarize it. A boy goes on a journey. <laughs> He comes home from school one day, bored with everything, finds this large box containing a car in the Phantom toll booth, and it comes with some directions. And so he gets in the toll booth and finds himself in this completely other place. Dictionopolis and Digitopolis. Everything is wordplay. He meets two traveling companions, one a sort of large overstuffed dog with a clock embedded in its side. Well, there's talk, Milo, and the humbug. Rescuing rhyme and reason. And so this becomes the epic quest that the three of them undertake. Well, I think it's still just as funny as it was the day I first read it. Definitely. Well, it's certainly the Alice in Wonderland of our time. The Phantom Tollbooth is one of the great works of fantasy for children in American literature. It shows readers that thinking is um, a playful activity and that it, it's a way of expanding um, your universe as you come to look beyond what uh, Norton Jester calls expectations. Uh, when the book came out, I was told, number one, it wasn't a children's book. Number two, uh, the vocabulary was much too difficult. And the killer, of course, was the last one, which was that fantasy was bad for children because it disoriented them. And this was, this was the wisdom as it was in, in 1961. It's, we're not so far from that now in somewhat different ways. You know, in some ways, that whole life we led then seems a million miles away. Uh, we were all quite young. Doing this book was something I'd never done before, and I didn't know what to do or what to expect. And Jules was beginning to f feel the uh, success, you know, so his perception of himself was changing. It was the first children's book I ever did, yes, and I thought it was going to be the last. I mean, this was the Cold War 50s. I was interested in overthrowing the government. We had a great group of people who lived in and around Brooklyn Heights and in Manhattan. Uh, children's book writers and illustrators. That's where I met Jules. We, I rented a room in a uh, brownstone in Brooklyn Heights. And he was living in the same building upstairs. And what were you doing in that house over on State Street? We were trying to make out with, we were trying to lure women into the house. <laughs> and all, and we were very bad at luring women into the house, so we... I wasn't, my mother used to drop by occasionally. That's true. <laughs> where were we? 